corals actually have a natural healing process. It's kind of like scar tissue. And if you cut up one original solid piece of coral, one of the same um, corals from a single parent colony, and you cut them up to these tiny pieces, micro fragments, you put them near each other, it triggers a healing process and the corals will start fusing back together. So you cut them up, they fuse back together. You cut them up, they fuse back together. That's really important, not only because it means it can drive down the cost for growing corals, but some coral species, the bouldering, massive, encrusting ones, can take decades, if not centuries, to grow from the size of a, a coin to the size of a dinner plate. And we can now grow them in months and years instead of decades and centuries. We basically can give corals the spot treatment or take them to the gym. We can make it just the way they like it from temperature and flow rates and light, all these different parameters to promote health or growth rates. Or we can look at what scientists project future ocean temperatures may be. We can raise the temperatures in our tanks and bring them back down. We can stress harden the corals, identify which corals are naturally more resilient, even through uh, coral spawning, the, the way that they can reproduce sexually, crossbreed corals from the same species, but have naturally resilient genotypes. So that as we do this work, once they're ready for outplanting in six, 12, 24 months, we can also boost the resilience of the corals we've grown so they can better survive threats that are killing them like warming oceans. One of the restoration sites in Grand Bahama had 75% survivorship of corals after one year. In the Caribbean and the Bahamas, if you have 30 to 50% survivorship after one year, that's considered a good project. So we had at one site, 75%, another site, 30%, another site, 99%. We also recorded compared to pre-restoration surveys, nearly a two-fold increase in fish populations, which is good for biodiversity. That restoration site is also near a well, local Bahamian fishing village. And of those fish, we had nearly a double increase in parafish populations, which are really important for reef health, and a nearly two-fold decrease in damselfish populations, which when things are thrown out of whack can be harmful to corals. We're seeing really positive results thus far in the short time we've been operating. And after the mass bleaching events from the spikes in ocean temperature last summer, we did lose corals, um, which was unfortunate. But we also saw corals we planted survive, uh, where sadly the natural reef all around it perished. So there's more work to be done, but seeing corals that we've grown with these more resilient uh, approaches. Surviving is still very encouraging considering the, the threats we face. It's frankly absurd that our job even exists. We shouldn't live in a world where coral restoration is necessary. Since the 1970s, we've lost over half of the world's coral reefs. And by 2050, due to pollution, overfishing, habitat destruction, and climate change, we're on track to lose over 90% of the world's reefs. So really within an average human lifespan in this 1970s, 2050, we could see almost all the world's coral reefs disappear right in front of us. And the best thing to do for reefs is to stop killing them, which requires our leaders to act to solve for the climate crisis and pollution and, and the like. But as we wait for those solutions to be implemented, we also can do things like restoring coral reefs to ensure that these ecosystems will survive and thrive for generations to come.